Do you know that your shooting skills are only halfway to make your footage look great? Color grading is the other half that can either turn your footage to epic or possibly destroy your hard day's work and throw it in the amateur look realm. As indie filmmakers, most of the times we can't afford neither the time or money to send our work to a professional colorist. We'll have to do it ourselves, which can be very frustrating. So if you're an indie filmmaker or DP who wants to color grade your work without the hassle of learning any professional coloring softwares, then this method is for you. Let's face it, we are not colorists, and we're focused more on the craft of cinematography and filmmaking. So we find ourselves pressured to learn proper means of color grading to ensure our projects look the way we have planned and imagined. In this modern day of filmmaking, the ability to color grade your footage is a skill you need to acquire as an indie filmmaker or DP. The good news is that grading with adjustment layers is what I believe the most effective and easiest method to color your footage in a non-professional coloring environment. This method existed for some time already, and since day one of discovering it, I kept on experimenting and fine-tuning the best practices, and I feel I have found the most effective ways to maximize its potential. And that's what I'm happy to share with you today. I advise you to watch the full episode at least once, and I'll leave timestamps for this tutorial to help you go back to the parts you need once you start applying this method on your projects. Also, if you stick around to the end of the episode, I'll be sharing a small giveaway with everyone from the awesome people at Epidemic Sound. Let's jump in. The first thing we need to know is that there are two types of coloring workflows, layer-based and node-based. Layer-based is the most common one, since it's used in the most popular editing-centric software such as Premiere Pro and Final Cut X. It's based on stacking effects and adjustments in layers on top of each other, which we call adjustment layers. They're the subject of this episode. As for node-based, it's usually used in dedicated color grading software such as DaVinci Resolve and Baselight. It's a much more complex method of grading, widely used in a more professional setup as it's much more capable than the layer-based system. It basically applies effects and adjustments through a network of parallel and serial nodes that converge to one single output which is the final graded image. In this episode I'll be using Final Cut X, but not to worry, the concept works exactly the same across all other editing softwares with a layer-based workflow namely the most popular Premiere Pro. Final Cut X might not be the most advanced tool for color grading, of course, but it has the basic tools you need for a great start. Yet with a couple of additional plugins such as Color Finale, M Film Look, or Film Convert, you will get access to much more advanced tools. Disclaimer, I'm not sponsored by any of those plugins, but these are the ones that I personally found to have helped me push my grading skills forward. I happily paid the full fee for each of those plugins. I'll leave the links in the description below. So what's an adjustment layer? It's a layer where all the effects, transformations and adjustments applied to it will equally affect all the layers that falls below it in a serial and additive way, like how stacking optical filters work on lenses. I strongly suggest that each layer will be assigned only one adjustment. Combining more than one adjustment in one layer will defy the reason for having all your effects visually laid out in layers. And it might also cause confusion, especially if you have a complex grading style. If you are using Final Cut X, I'll leave a link in the description for a free adjustment layer from the amazing people at Triple Training. I'll be using clips from the music video Get On to explain the process. It's one of my recent music videos I shot and directed with the awesome singer Coley. So let's jump to my timeline to show you how it looks on an actual project. So as you can see here, I have my edit with all the clips lined up, and above each clip you'll find the corresponding set of adjustment layers needed to achieve that specific look on that clip. I can toggle on and off each individual layer to see its effect on the clip and layers below it. I've also named each layer based on the adjustment or effect it applies to the clip below it, such as LUT, Color, Luma, Vignette, Flare, and so on. Now if you look here, I have some adjustment layers that stretch across two or more clips, such as the crop layer, as it might crop different regions from some clips compared to others, and some other layers even cover the whole timeline, as they host adjustments that have more global impact, such as the primary LUT that will convert my V-Log from the GH5 to the look I'll further fine-tune in the secondary color grade. Also, the film grain layer that I added as a finishing touch on top of my final look. As for everything in between, they are more or less very specific to each clip individually. But you might have noticed a common pattern here. The order of adjustment layers is not random, it is following a specific pattern. Remember when I mentioned earlier how an adjustment layer affects all the layers that falls below it in a serial and additive way? 
What that means is that each adjustment is practically altering the image by stretching or contracting the chrominance or luminance to result in the new look. Like how the LUT layer changes and restricts the color range from the original image that has the maximum range the sensor offered than VLOG to a new look that might look better to your eyes but fits within a smaller color range that is dictated by that LUT. Same for the Luma adjustment and how it will stretch or contract the original luminance to restrict it to a new luminance range. So with each adjustment layer, the resulting image with its new look will be the starting point for the following layer above it which will more often than not have a smaller and more restricted chroma and luma range. So you need to be cautious with which layer goes before the other to minimize the loss of color or luma information by limiting the amount of layers you'll need to achieve your desired look, as well as carefully pick the effect and its perfect layer order in the hierarchy to maximize its potential. So what is the best order to achieve all what I just talked about? Let's find out. The order will be split into four main sets the pre-grade, which would have effects or adjustments not related to coloring, but need to exist before you start building your look, such as a denoising layer, or maybe a special effect, such as environmental overlays, like rain, dust, or smoke effects, or even 3D objects. Those are layers that are considered part of the scene, that will need to have the same look applied to them. Second comes the look set, which will contain all the layers that control your creative look, such as LUTs, color, and luma adjustments. They're commonly categorized under primary and secondary adjustments. Then on top of that would be the fine-tuned set, which is dedicated for local adjustments, meaning all the adjustments that affect only portions of the image, such as adjusting skin colors, skies, or simply adding a vignette. And finally, the finish. Similar to the pre-grade set, it's not a color adjustment, but it's rather dedicated to adding finishing effects on the image, such as lens flares, grain, and so on. Let's jump back to the timeline. Okay, so here I laid out some of the clips from the video that would be a good example to demonstrate how to use the adjustment layers. Here I have a clip that doesn't have any adjustment on top of it. And in the title menu, you can go to custom. You'll find the ripple training adjustment layer that I told you about. You can just drag and drop it here. And of course, adjust the length to the clip. Now you can go to the adjustment layer and in the inspector, you can see the name here, which you can change for instance to LUT. Once you do, you'll have an adjustment layer with the corresponding name that will help you understand what effect it applies to the image. Now your adjustment layer is ready to host the LUT effect. So in my case, I would go to Color Finale, which is the plugin of choice that I use for LUTs. I can just drag and apply here. Once it's there, I can go to the Effects menu and open the controls. And then I can choose the folder that has my LUTs. In my case, I'm using a pretty creative LUT pack that I bought from DLUTs, specifically for the Panasonic Vlog. I'm just going to select it. And now when I show in the gallery, I'll be able to see all the effects applied in a grid manner for me to choose from. Once you select the LUT, it will be applied and then you can apply more layers in the same way to fine tune it. Now let's delete this one and show you what I did with the actual clips that I have. So let's go to the first one, let's select everything and deactivate them to show you how I started. So this was the first image that I had. First thing I need to do is to look for the LUT that would be the starting point. I kind of like this LUT because it has a monochromatic look to the image without losing much of the color information. This brownish feel to it can be further improved with color and luma adjustments. So the next thing I did is I added a color adjustment layer. This is the before and this is the after. As you can see, I added a little bit of blue in the whole image to kind of tone down this brownish feel. I lowered the highlights a little bit, same thing for the shadows. And here I lifted the midtones to kind of see a little bit more details in the flag he's wearing as he pretty much falls within the midtone range. Now if I go back to the LUT and toggle it on and off, it shows that it expanded the waveform but it's actually limiting the color and luma of the image to a specific range related to that LUT. So in order to expand it back again to how it was, I'm gonna add a luma adjustment layer below the LUT. I called it Luma 1, which pretty much expanded the luma range at least here. And of course here I don't have much of an issue because I have a lot of headroom for the highlights. Now it's time to go to the creative luma adjustment. So I added another adjustment layer here and I called it Luma 2. And as you can see in the image, it kind of lowered the contrast a little bit and gave it this dusty and aesthetic look. Keep in mind one important thing when you're controlling Luma. I would use the curves to precisely target a Luma range. But if you want more global effects, then I would use the wheels instead. Because with the wheels you can adjust the whole image with the master control, but when it comes to the highlights, shadows and midtones, you're not being able to pick a very specific range of it. This is why I would usually go to the curves, which would give me a very precise adjustment in a very specific area. You can just grab one point, and you can keep on fine-tuning it to your liking, 
maybe add another point next to it till you find the range that you actually want to control. So far I'm liking the luma adjustment here and I think I can go to the next step which is bringing some of his details up especially after that I added the luma 2 which added a little bit of a dusty feel to it. So in this case I added this adjustment layer and I called it PW as in power window. This is a term that is used in DaVinci Resolve when you want to have a masked effect on something. As you can see it's affecting his face and chest area. And again if you go here in the adjustment controls you can see the effect that I applied here. I kind of feel it's a little bit too much so in the mix I'm just gonna lower it a little bit. Now this looks good to me. Let's go back and toggle on and off. It is subtle but to me it gives this little punch that I need in the image. Now as I look at the image again, I feel if I add some vignetting around him, it will drag your attention to him even further. So let's add one more layer here, I called it vignette. Then as you can see here, I have a shape mask that is controlling the curves adjustment. And in the curves adjustment, I'm only selecting the dark areas of the image. Of course I'll keep on playing till I see which effect looks better to me. I feel this looks good enough, and let's go back, and we can toggle it on and off. This looks good to me and it has a bit of a cinematic feel to it, so I'll keep it. Now let's zoom in a little bit. And if I go here, you can see that there's a light behind him that comes up. I was using a Sigma lens that doesn't have much of a lens flare, but I needed to add a lens flare to give this extra cinematic effect to the image. So I used the digital lens flare in this case. I'll leave the plugin link in the description below. Then as you can see, once I applied it, it gave a nice haloing effect around him and a bit of cinematic flares here and there. So as for this image, I feel it's pretty much done. The finishing effect would be something like a sharpen effect applied on another adjustment layer. Then I added some green to give it this organic feel as well. And then the final one would be a crop or a letterbox effect, which gives you a cinemascope crop to the image to cheat a little bit as if it's shot on anamorphic lenses. Now, after I added this, I felt that his head is a little bit too close to the edges of the image. So I'm just gonna offset it down a little bit. Now, if I go back and play it, this looks good. Now there's one more thing I can do. Maybe I need to add some dust around him. So what I did is that I grabbed a dust effects layer, link in the description as well, and I added right below everything. The reason why I did that is because the dust layer is actually part of the scene and I wanted it to follow the color grading look that I have already on top of it. Let's check it out again. And I think I'm happy with this progress. Of course I have the LUT that is applied on everything else around here. What I'm gonna do next is pretty much copy the color and luma effects and kind of paste them everywhere since everything needs to have the same color and look it's just a matter of tweaking rather than changing completely. So let's take another clip. I pretty much copied and pasted the color and luma adjustment here and of course to counter the LUT effect I added the luma at the bottom then I feel that here I need a little bit of a more vignette around the image so I added this vignette layer then the crop layer to give it this cinemascope effect and voila. Last point I want to discuss is in some cases you have a noisy image. So for example, this clip was shot at 180 frames per second and it was at Full HD on the GH5, which is by default a much noisier clip than the 4K that I shot everywhere else. So what I had to do is to denoise it first before applying anything else. And this is why the denoise is at the very bottom of this hierarchy that I have on top of it. Followed by the Luma one that will expand the LUT Luma range. And then everything else related to the look will come in the middle, such as the color and Luma in this case. Keep in mind that as I went through the color grade, I kept on fine tuning things. So for example, this power window only existed after I added the lens flare. Because once I applied the lens flare, I felt that they're a little bit too faded out. So I had to counter that with the power window as you can see, to bring back a little bit of this contrast that I needed in this shot. Which is another very important point, that you need to keep fine tuning the adjustments above and below the adjustment layer that you're on, as whatever you're working on might fix something but break something else but be careful not to add too much layers. Okay, so let's recap. The first layer you need to add is the cleanup layer, typically a denoiser if required. That's because in some cases your LUT might act differently depending on how much colored noise you have. Then comes the environmental overlays, such as dust, snow, rain, and so on. The reason it's placed before the look is that its color will need to blend with the final look of the whole image, as it's literally representing objects that are part of the narrative. Then comes the LUT and color adjustments. As mentioned in my previous video, LUT is rarely a one-click color grading fix. It's only a start to what will become your own unique and creative look, which can be achieved through further color, white balance, and tint adjustments from your side. Also keep in mind that, as LUTs convert luma and chroma values, they often limit the image's luma range by lifting blacks or lowering the highlights. Just like LUTs you find in more commercial packs that offer things such as vintage look or film emulations. 
That's why in some cases, I add contrast layer below the LUT layer. Its main mission is rescuing the highlights and shadows by countering the LUTs effect and bringing those lost luma levels within the LUTs range. So this layer is mainly a rescue layer that will pave the way for the creative contrast layer that will come on top, which will build the tonal contrast for your creative look. Of course, both chroma and luma adjustments can be broken down into as many layers as you need to achieve your desired look, keeping in mind that with each layer, you're potentially restricting the latitude for the layer that follows above it. Then we move to the next set of local adjustments, starting with power windows or masked adjustments. They only affect specific regions of the image that need specific type of attention, such as skin recovery, boosting local contrast on faces or objects, or maybe tweaking a color of a specific object then followed by vignetting if needed, which in essence is a luma adjustment affecting mainly the corners of the image, the results of which will focus the viewer's attention on the subject or the action. And in the final set of finishing touches, we start with all optical effects that will not follow your color grading look, such as lens flares and light leaks. The reason is simply because this is how it actually works in real lenses. A purple lens flare, for example, will always be purple no matter what the scene color is. Those light effects could be from a plugin or stock footage, in both cases, you will have full control over their color if needed. I'll be leaving a link in the description to the lens flare effect I used in my video. Finally, on top of all this, if needed, we can add sharpen, film grain, or crop layers. Sharpen is self-explanatory. Film grain is of course an aesthetic choice, and it also helps with concealing compression artifacts such as macro blocking. And finally, cropping or letterbox, if you need to give your film a cinemascope crop of 239 to 1 or similar. Keep in mind the grain layer should always be on any layer above the sharpen adjustment. Otherwise, you'll be sharpening the grain along the way, which could look a little bit unnatural or exaggerated. Now, all these layers will fall under our four main sets of pre-grade, look, fine-tune, and finish. So what are the main advantages of using adjustment layers? First, since we are a more visually driven breed of people, this method allows you to visually see all the effects applied on all the clips at a single glance on the timeline, without the need to go into every clip to check its effects in the effects menu. For example, here's a clip created with the adjustment layer technique, offering a quick snapshot of which effects are applied to it and in which order. Now here's the same clip with the same effects applied in the traditional way. As you can see, some effects has to still be applied in layers, such as film grain and dust, while the others are found in the clip's effects menu, which looks a lot messier and convoluted as you can see. Even with the traditional effects method, some effects won't work as expected. Take here the letterbox crop effect. It'll have to be applied through an adjustment layer still, simply because I rotated this clip to adjust the horizon level, and by doing so, the effect will follow that rotation. So the only way to correct it is to add it to an adjustment layer outside, adding to the complexity and inconvenience of that traditional method. Second advantage, you can apply the same effects to adjacent clips simply by extending the layer to cover them as well which is usually used in global adjustments such as LUTs or Sharpen effect. And in the case of other local adjustments that can change from one clip to the next, such as Luma or Color, you can simply extend the layer, then cut it to fit the corresponding clips below it, then finally start your fine-tuning process on each one. You can also drag and drop a copy of those layers on top of any other clip on the timeline, compared to the traditional way which risks to be a big waste of time for copying and pasting. Here's an example where I need to copy a single effect from this clip to another one. First, I'll simply copy the layer. Then, to paste that specific effect with the paste effects command, you'll need to fiddle around by unchecking all the other unwanted effects to finally settle on the one you want to apply. Pretty counterproductive and time consuming, especially if you have a lot of effects such as in this case. And finally, a feature specific to Final Cut X. You can assign a type of adjustment layers to roles, like how I have them here categorized under color, flares, environment effects, and so on. You can visually locate them all on your timeline as you select their corresponding role. Even toggle them on and off all at once with a click of a button, which grays them out as you can see here. A very useful use of this feature is when denoising your clips, since by default denoising plugins are very processing intensive effects. Once you add all the denoise layers on your desired noisy clips, you can simply turn them all off by unchecking this button to prevent the plugin from slowing down your computer as you work on grading other clips then toggle them back on right before you export your timeline. I would like to end by saying that this method have dramatically improved my grading workflow. It made me focus more on the creative aspect of color grading and less on the technical challenges that come with professional coloring softwares. I'm not trying to prevent you from learning any pro grading app such as DaVinci Resolve, but rather to offer you an easy solution if you want to stay focused on the craft of cinematography. 
and at the same time, practice the skills needed to prepare you for the next big step in learning DaVinci Resolve when you're ready to take that leap. I urge you to experiment with this method, break the rules, have fun with it. Use the theories I mentioned as principles, not rules. We'd truly love to hear from your experiments in the comments below. Now for the giveaway, the awesome people at Epidemic Sound are kind enough to offer everyone a free 30 days business subscription. Use this code below to get your free months of awesome music and sound effects to use on all your projects. If you're more of a content creator and don't need a business subscription, then I'll also be leaving an affiliate link with 30 days free trial below. Finally, if you like this episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to stay tuned with my DP journey. Thanks again, I'll see you next time.